Welcome to everyone again. And let's now have our first speaker, Dr. Natasha Robinette, who's our chief of uh, radiology uh, and everything imaging. And she's gonna walk us through what it means to have cancer imaging. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Heath, for that introduction and discussing today's agenda of events. Um, it's an honor and a privilege waiting for my slide deck to come up. Um, it's an honor and a privilege to be here today to discuss with you um, the detection of cancer and the role of imaging in oncology. Just a little bit about myself. I am a local girl. I was born and raised in a small farming community, Standish, Michigan, kind of equidistant between Bay City and Tawas. I uh, graduated high school from Swartz Creek, which is, which is a suburb of Flint. And then I received my undergraduate, my medical school, my radiology, and my neuroradiology fellowship education from a combination of Michigan State, Wayne State, and the University of Michigan. I've been a neuroradiologist at the Comanis Cancer Center for 15 years, and I've been the clinical service chief of imaging for eight years. Um, but more impactful than all of that, I am a cancer survivor. During my first year, thank you. During my, during my first year of residency, um, I was diagnosed with sarcoma on my scalp. And I went through, over the course of three years, nine excisional surgeries, three tissue re-expansions, because I lost about 50% of my scalp, um, three tissue expansions, and then craniofacial reconstruction. I am now more than 20 years cancer free. So this one thing is the driver for me that makes me strive every day to push my imaging team to provide um, compassionate care, um, high quality, precision, state-of-the-art imaging for our Carmanos patients. Um, cancer is the second leading cause of death in the United States. Um, this is what is uniting us all in the room today. Um, cancer does not discriminate. Um, it cuts across all socioeconomic boundaries, race, race and ethnicity. The oncology care team at Carmanos is very patient-centric with this whole team of subspecialty physicians and support group, um, one of which is imaging and radiology. And at Carmanos Cancer Center, our imaging team all we do is cancer imaging. So I think all of you know time on task is where you gain expertise, and this is what you have with the Carmanos imaging team. Um, for the purpose of today's talk, I think it's very confusing, all of the imaging modalities. It's a little bit of alphabet soup. They all have big names. They all have abbreviations, um, CT, MRI, PET scan. But for the purposes of today's talk, I really want you to think about all of these imaging modalities are basically a window for the radiologist to look at the patient's body inside, internally, to look for abnormalities and to detect cancer. These are things that you can't see by just visually looking at the patient. Some of the things in the radiologist imaging toolbox, I want to give you a few examples. Um, but really for the radiologist day in and day out, we're kind of playing this game. And I think many of you might recognize this person, but it's, where's Waldo? So our job is to find Waldo. So for instance, here with this CAT scan, there's this very large heterogeneously enhancing left renal cell carcinoma. Um, on the MR, there's this ring enhancing lesion in a breast cancer patient that has brain metastases. On a PET scan, um, for all practical purposes, here's the right upper lobe lung cancer that's lighting up on the PET scan. Um, on a bone scan, which is used to detect bone metastasis, this is a little bit of definitely where was Waldo. This is a subtle finding, this uptake in the skull base. Actually, this patient presented with tongue numbness. And this lesion in the skull base, if you know your job and you're a good radiologist, you know that the nerve coming from the brain innervating the tongue runs through this area. So this patient's clinical symptoms of tongue num numbness had everything to do with that she had a, a bone metastasis to her skull base. Um, mammogram imaging, detecting the cancer. Cancer on mammogram is white, so here's this round cancer on a breast mammogram. And then subsequent ultrasound of that same breast lesion that we can see here, it's this low density lesion on ultrasound that allows us to target that for biopsy. So these are just some of the things in the radiologist imaging toolbox. 
So imaging and oncology. So for the cancer patient, your journey is kind of a road. And in that road, there are some curves and there's some hills. Um, but imaging is there each step of the way, guiding along this path of cancer care. Initially, either with cancer screening, um, two of the um, screening for cancer um, with imaging is breast cancer and lung cancer. So whether your, your cancer was diagnosed with image screening, um, Along the road, we consider these other areas kind of a work in progress. So once the cancer is found, you need to do accurate staging of that cancer, basically guiding the oncology team um, what stage that cancer is to help provide the appropriate treatment options for that patient. Um, diagnosis for imaging, a lot of times getting um, tissue sampling of the cancer can be image-guided biopsies, whether CT, MR, or ultrasound. Some of the therapies for cancer care are image driven. Um, next, once your cancer is diagnosed and you start on a treatment, imaging is really the workhorse of assessing treatment response and how that cancer is responding to the treatment that your care team is providing. Whether the cancer is gone and better or whether the cancer is still there but a little bit better or maybe it's gotten worse and that's really gonna guide your care team in treatment options of either staying the course with the current therapy or changing to a new therapy. And then lastly, um, this is what we kind of call cruise control. Once you're cancer free or in remission, imaging is there basically based on your cancer. Many people end up having clinical evaluation on a yearly basis as well as imaging. And that's to look for any recurrence of your original tumor and or find other cancers that you may be at risk for or secondary cancers. So what is cancer screening? Um, some cancers um, have no symptoms or are considered silent. Um, cancer screening is basically, basically targeted testing for early detection of cancer. And I think as we all know here in the audience, early detection is key. Early detection of cancer is what results in better outcomes and increased survival. So let's talk about cancer in the US population. So in males, the top three cancers are lung, prostate, and colorectal. In women, the top three cancers are lung, breast, and colorectal. So if you're gonna be a cancer screening test, you better touch on the top three cancers that are found in men and women. And indeed, the cancer screening tests that we have are these listed above, and the four to the left are those top three for men and women. And two of those that we're gonna focus on today are cancer screening that are image-driven, and that's breast and lung. So breast cancer screening, what is it? It's a screening breast mammogram, and that's a special type of x-ray that detects breast abnormalities. The images to the left is a screening breast mammogram that's normal, there's no abnormality detected. A little bit of background with mammography, the darker areas are fat in the breast, the whiter areas are glandular tissue in the breast. And unfortunately, cancer on mammogram shows up as white, which is just like the glandular tissue. So it really takes a special eye to detect if there's an abnormality and detect early cancer. So the images to the right, we're gonna play this Where's Waldo? There's an abnormality in this that our breast radiologist detected that went on to be biopsy proven breast cancer. And that's the subtle abnormality. So this is what our team at Planus is trained to do, is seek out and find those subtle findings and abnormalities to detect early cancer. Who should be screened with breast mammogram? Um, women at the age of 40 should have annual, yearly screening breast mammography. Um, if it can be done earlier if you have increased risk factors. For instance, if you have a strong family history of breast cancer, if you have dense breasts, if you have genetic risk factors such as an already history of ovarian cancer, or if you have the breast cancer genes one and two. Why should you be screened? I think we've already talked about it that breast cancer is one of the most common cancers in women. This will affect one in eight women in this country. And in Michigan alone, there will be just under 7,800 new breast cancer diagnoses. Um, when breast cancer is detected early, this is a powerful number. When it's detected early, the five-year survival is almost 100%. And lastly, it takes 30 minutes. So a little bit of time input for a little bit of health reassurance. 
lung cancer screening. So this is an image-guided cancer screening that really is targeted towards an at-risk population. So these are patients who are smokers or who have been smokers that have quit within the last 15 years. And it's really between the ages of 50 to 80 that we screen, and patients need to have what's called a 20-pack year history. Pack year history is basically years you've smoked and the amount of packs per day you smoked. So if you were a smoker for 10 years and you smoked two packs a day, that's a 20 pack year history. If you were a smoker for 20 years and smoked one pack per day, that's a 20 pack year history. So these are the people who we're really screening, so heavy smokers that are gonna be at risk for lung cancers. And how is it screened? It's screened with a low dose CT scan. Um, it does not require IV contrast, so no IV. It's relatively painless. Um, this is an image on the right that basically the patient lies on a bed the imaging acquisition is literally maybe 15 to 20 seconds, extremely quick. So here's an example of a lung cancer screening study. Um, on the right, the image depicting this spiculated right upper lobe lung lesion, very early, small, early detection of lung cancer, and essentially screening with low-dose spiral CT reduces lung cancer deaths by 15 to 20% in heavy smokers. Um, once the cancer is detected, this is really where the work in progress starts. And your oncologist has a toolbox and they need to gather data to figure out the best treatment options for you. And some of that data gathering is, is that they need tissue sampling. They need to get biopsy and sampling of the cancer. They're going to need blood work. Some cancers have specific um, tumor markers that are found in blood that they're going to test for and follow throughout. And then lastly, they need accurate cancer staging. And imaging is really the workhorse of that accurate cancer staging. And accurate cancer staging really involves looking at how big this, the tumor is, whether the tumor has spread to other parts of the body, and this really helps determine um, uh, how serious your cancer is and helps predict what your chances of survival are. So accurate cancer staging, again, we're back to our imaging toolbox. For certain types of cancers, that's going to be a combination of CT, MR, ultrasound, PET, and nuclear imaging. Here's an example of accurate cancer staging. This was a large right posterior upper lobe lung mass that was found on CT imaging. Subsequent PET imaging for staging showed that lung cancer lighting up, but unfortunately on the same image, we see another small area that's lighting up, and that's a local lymph node. So now we know that yes, this is a tumor in the lung. Yes, it has gone elsewhere outside of the lung. So there's tumor spread. And this is really gonna guide your treatment options. So the lower the cancer staging, usually treatment can be done with surgery alone, sometimes a combination of surgery with chemotherapy or radiation. But once you're at a higher stage cancer, most of the time the option of surgery is off the table. No longer is surgery the appropriate treatment option. And it will be a combination of radiation, chemotherapy, those alone, sometimes targeted therapy, which is really targeting genes, um, proteins, or a pathway within the cancer itself that the treatment is going to attack or immunotherapy, which is basically ramping up the own the, your own body's immune system to recognize cancer is foreign and to attack it. Um, up until this point, I've kind of talked about the things that we're looking for and finding the where's Waldo on the imaging related to cancer. But we have these special imaging techniques that help us detect things that we might not actually see with our eyes on conventional imaging like CT and MR. Um, I kind of call this like Superman's x-ray vision or, um, and here's an example of that. So in prostate cancer, we have this special agent that on PET imaging, um, this image to the right, I don't want you to concentrate on the really heavy black areas. I want you to look at the little spiculated black dots scattered throughout, kind of in the left axilla or upper arm area and in the right lower leg. These are areas that on CT and MR imaging, our eyes would not have detected. Um, but with this special imaging study, we can actually see that indeed this cancer has spread and it's not just confined to the prostate. Another example of the same study, um, these lymph nodes that are lighting up very bright on this axial PET imaging, 
those lymph nodes were normal in size. So on CT and MR imaging, we would have said there's normal sized lymph nodes, and that's usually not concerning. But on this special pet agent study, those lit up really bright and hot, which again tells us cancer has left the prostate and it's spread to local lymph nodes. Another example of this, things that our eye can't necessarily detect, is a special type of tumor called neuroendocrine tumor and with a special imaging agent on PET that again, I don't want you to concentrate on the big black areas, I want you to concentrate on the little dots, little ink blots that you see. These are again areas diffusely, even some of them up, up as high as in the neck and head that we would not have detected on CT and MR imaging, but with these special imaging agents, we can detect and say, yep, this cancer has spread, and that's gonna guide treatment options. So once cancer is found, you often need a tissue diagnosis, and up until this point with imaging, either with cancer screening or with cancer staging, the radiologist has basically taken a backstage. They're behind the scenes. Once they do the imaging, of course they're talking with your oncologist and your care team, but you as a patient or a family member may have not have actually met your radiologist or your imaging care team. Um, but at this point where tissue diagnosis is needed, this is where the radiologist comes up front and center, and you're actually probably meeting them when they're getting consent for performing CT guided, MR guided, or ultrasound guided biopsies to gain tissue to actually get the exact cell type of your cancer. And some of the examples of this, um, this is one I actually did recently, you can see the bright linear biopsy needle that's going into this nodule that was a thyroid nodule that proved to be a thyroid cancer. Um, here's some CT guided imaging. You can see the nice linear biopsy needle. The patient is on their um, left side and this is biopsying a left upper lobe lung mass. Um, additional image with that bright imaging needle going right through that lung mass so we know that we're getting good tissue sampling. And then another example, this patient is actually lying on their, their belly and the linear bright imaging um, biopsy needle is going to a left adrenal mass. Um, other areas that imaging helps with diagnosis and treatment of the cancer patient is some patients will require chemotherapy and that chemotherapy needs to be administered into the vascular system and into the veins. So the interventional radiologist is really skilled at using an ultrasound to find a vein and place needles and wires to put a catheter in to leave a, a vascular access for the chemotherapy to be administered. So one of those examples is, um, this is a peripherally inserted line that actually comes from the right upper lobe and that linear line, you can see it going, and it's in the appropriate place right near the large vein near the heart to administer chemotherapy. Another um, vascular access for chemotherapy that we place is a chemotherapy or infusiport um, where this is basically tunneled underneath the chest wall and can be accessed with a needle each time chemotherapy is administered. And it too also, um, from that tunneled catheter under the chest wall, enters into a vein and comes back here to deliver chemotherapy near the area of the heart. Um, additional areas that radiology help um, are complications of cancer. So cancer patients, um, blood can be thick and a little bit hypercoagulable and can lead to forming blood clots. And when blood clots form in the legs, they can break loose and go up and travel back to the heart and then go to the lung and, what, and uh, cause what's called a pulmonary embolus, which can be fatal. So sometimes radiology is called upon for these patients who have blood clots in their legs to place basically a filtered wire basket to stop those blood clots from going back to the heart. And this is placed in the abdomen. And this is just an example of that that was placed intravascularly by the radiologist using a combination of ultrasound, fluoroscopy, and image guidance. Um, other complications of cancer can be that the kidneys sometimes can be affected and can't drain properly. And the interventional radiologist can place tubes in the kidneys to let them drain externally until the cancer can be treated or complication can be treated and the kidneys can start to drain normally. And at that time, those tubes can be removed. And these are just examples of bilateral renal or nephrostomy tubes. Other things that imaging can help with is actually with the treatment of cancer. So this is a pretty specific image guided treatment of here's a heterogeneous um, liver metastasis from neuroendocrine tumor, which is very vascular. And just like the cardiologist who can do a heart catheterization through vessels, 
and get catheters up to the heart vessels, the interventionalists can actually get catheters to just about any artery in the body. And this is an example of that catheter injecting contrast into the left hepatic artery, which is feeding the liver. And you can see with these all little small arrows, these kind of small round blushes. And these are hypervascular, highly vascular liver metastases. And just like you can catheterize this artery to look for the vascular blush for tumor, you can actually deliver site-directed therapy, chemotherapy, radioembolization agents to these tumors. And that's the last image, which you see the vascular blush. And this is just one image showing the vascular blush going to treating site-directed liver mets. This will have multiple runs and multiple treatments of these liver mets over the course of about three to four hours. Another treatment that radiology can administer for cancer is freezing a tumor, or what we call cryoablation. So this is an example of a heterogeneously enhancing left renal mass. Um, this renal masses can be very vascular, so they have a risk of bleeding. This had two courses of radiology therapy. One was on the first day the patient was brought in, and um, the interventionalist, just like the heart doctor, used wires and catheters to inject contrast into the left renal artery, and you can see this large ball of vascular blushing of the tumor. And then they injected little particles that went in and basically clogged up all the little end arteries of this tumor so that when the freezing therapy is administered, there's less risk of bleeding. So on the next day, the patient then was brought and placed left side down, and probes externally were placed from the back into the renal cancer, and this kind of low density at the tip of these very bright probes is actually the freeze ball. It's actually a freeze zone of where the tumor was frozen. Um, so once the cancerous diagnosis and treatment is started, um, imaging, again, is the workhorse to look at the cancer therapy that's being provided. How is the cancer responding to that? Um, is it a complete response, meaning that the tumor is gone? Is it a partial response, meaning that the tumor is still there, but it's smaller? Or is it worse? Is the tumor growing, and that's a progression of the tumor? And really, on imaging, determining this and letting your oncologist and your care team know whether the tumor is worse or better is really going to guide. This is kind of the, the, the crook in the road or the fork in the road, and it's going to guide what the next appropriate care of the cancer patient is. Here's a, um, an example of assessing treatment response. Uh, this is a laryngeal cancer that's obstructing the airway, or what we call a throat cancer. This is the PET imaging showing that tumor lighting up bright. This is three-month follow-up after therapy was administered, and you can see that the airway is smaller, but that's all related to radiation, and there's a little bit of edema, but that obstructing abnormal lesion isn't there anymore. And on PET imaging, it's not lighting up anymore. So this is what we would call a complete response. And for this patient, this is a good news. This is great news. This means to their oncologist and to their care team, to that patient, this treatment worked, and they're going to stay the course, and they're going to continue with this therapy, and they're going to continue to monitor this, this patient. Another example of assessing treatment response is this large ulcerative lesion in the oral cavity. On PET imaging with initial staging, it's lighting up nice and bright. And unfortunately, six months later, subsequent follow-up tumor assessment imaging shows that this is still lighting up on PET. So this is where the care team really puts a stop and a halt and a yield in care, and everybody comes together to discuss, well, is this treatment responding and it's going to continue to respond so we stay the course and do really do short-term follow-up imaging? Or is this tumor probably likely responded as much as it's going to and we need to consider adding the additional therapy or even consider doing new therapy? Um, and lastly, during the course of treatment, once the, cancer, the patient has been treated, you kind of enter into this stage of long-term surveillance when you're cancer-free or when you're in remission. And this is kind of the cruise control phase. And this is where, depending on your cancer, that you have yearly clinical evaluation as well as imaging to assess for, is there any recurrence of your original tumor? Or to look for additional secondary tumors that that patient may be at risk for. Um, this is, uh, the graph to the right is just depicting for head and neck cancer patients, additional cancers that they're at risk for that we can see on follow-up imaging are, first and foremost, additional head and neck cancers. 
Um, other things would be lung cancers, um, bladder cancers, gastric cancers. All of these are at risk because of some of the lifestyle risks for head and neck cancer patients, which include alcohol and smoking. Um, other examples of this for long-term surveillance imaging, why we're doing imaging surveillance and looking not just for the original cancer, but for other cancers, is that um, to the left, there's a graph depicting colorectal cancer. And the blue is cancers that were actually diagnosed in these same patients prior to their colorectal cancer diagnosis. And in the orange, those are cancers that were diagnosed after their colorectal diagnosis. And these are really all comers, which include melanoma, breast, prostate, kidney, and bladder. And on the right, this is data depicting for lung cancer patients, what other cancers are they at risk for? What are their second cancers? And for lung cancer, kind of similar to head and neck, number one, they're at risk for more lung cancers and bladder cancer and head and neck cancer. And a lot of that, again, is related to some of the risk factors related to alcohol and smoking. So in summary, um, imaging plays a big role in the patient's oncology care. Um, in the cancer pathway for the patient, imaging is always there, whether that's with initial staging and cancer being found with either breast or lung screening or other types of cancer screening. Um, kind of along the work in progress where they're there to help accurately diagnose and stage that patient um, so that the appropriate treatment um, can be started. Um, we're there for diagnosis, whether that's with image-guided biopsy, for treatment, whether that's freezing or site-directed therapy to tumors. Um, the big thing, treatment response. Imaging is there at multiple times during the patient's cancer care to reassess and see how the cancer is responding to therapy, to either stay the course with the current therapy or to add an additional therapy or start a new therapy. And then lastly, imaging is there when the patient is cancer free and they're years out from their cancer and now we're just yearly doing imaging to look for either any recurrence of their original cancer or secondary cancers that they may be at risk for. That is the conclusion of my talk, and I think now we have time for questions.